welcome you to week four, our final week of our 2021 Lenten study. I'd encourage you to go online to go to Bethlehem.org Lent to find this video and the study guide that you can print out. I'd also encourage you to have a pen or pencil along. So if there's a verse in your Bible, you can underline or circle words that are key to you. Or you can use the study guide to answer important questions that we talk about, whether you're doing this by yourself or with a group. Feel free at any time to pause this video to get those things together or to talk and discuss about what you hear. We're excited to have done these four weeks with you as we walk through three other areas. The first week was repenting, kind of knowing that Ash Wednesday was reminding us of our humanity and of the hope that we have in Jesus. And then our second week was about reorienting ourselves. That was through fasting or abstaining saying, oh my gosh, I actually am addicted to my phone or chocolate or whatever. Maybe I should fast from that for a couple days. So when Easter comes around, I realize how different I can be. Or abstaining, just saying, I don't have to do this for a period of time. It'll reconnect me with God. And last week, we looked at two other habits of Lent, prayer and penance. That idea of reconnecting, whether it's with God or with one another. But now we turn our hearts and minds towards Holy Week towards this adventure that takes us through a story we hear over and over again. And so probably it's a good time for us to refocus. That Lent allows us, over these 40 days, to refocus on what's important. On the most amazing story ever. The fact that God would redeem us. But that in do so, He would suffer for us. So, let's pray about that as we begin. Father, we thank You for the past three weeks. We thank You for your investment in us. We pray that this Lenten time would be one of growth and maturity and that you would draw our eyes toward what really happened. So we get so lost in details of our busy lives. Help us to refocus on you this week so we could celebrate Easter next week in a way that is satisfying and true to the calling you have to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we begin with a large scripture that's pretty incredible. This idea of Jesus knowing what he was doing, but the disciples not really having a clue. Of course, every story sounds good after you've lived it. You can describe a movie easily after you've seen it. But watching it, your mind races and you try and figure out what's going on. How could this possibly end? It was the same way in real life. You and I struggle with that with God. God, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing in my marriage, in my job, in my home, in my town? What are you doing during this year? Afterwards, we kind of get assurances that we didn't have while walking through. There's a section in Scripture in Mark that shares this very well. It says the whole group, Jesus, the apostles, those 12 men that were called to be captains, and all the disciples, we noticed there were up to 120 in Scripture. That's just the men being counted. We're following Jesus. And it says this, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. I don't know if you like to write in your Bible or not, but I often underline passages that I haven't seen before. You know, this is one of the unique times where Jesus is leading the crowd. In fact, we read that Jesus' policy was to send the disciples two by two ahead to the town that he was going to. And then he'd follow along. The disciples would go out. These apostles would go out and the disciples would go out. And they'd sit two by two say, God's kingdom would come and God's kingdom would come. And then Jesus would show up. Have you noticed that in your reading of scripture? That Jesus would walk into an action already happened. Whether it was the disciples trying to heal a demon or the disciples having caused a stir or the disciples having a complaint. Jesus was never in the lead. He was in the middle or in the back. They were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Ooh, there's a difference, isn't it? Jesus is leading toward Jerusalem, and they don't understand how this can possibly be a good plot line. How can God possibly help a church when a pastor retires? How can God possibly lead a church through a pandemic? There's no way that could come out well. Some followed Others were just afraid. Others were astonished. Where do you fit in that, in God's journey in your life? Either way, Jesus was leading the way, and he took the twelve, those captains, and he said to them, told them what was going to happen as he pulled them aside. 
Have you ever had in somebody do that? Maybe a teacher or a coach. That while the action of the room was going around, they pulled you to the side and they said something that they hoped would change your attitude. Oftentimes, I remember when my coaches did that to me, I thought I knew what they were saying. But it's only afterwards, maybe a month or two, maybe after the season ended, that I finally got, oh, if I had followed that advice, it would have been much better. And Jesus says this, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death. They'll hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Jesus refocuses the disciples, even though they don't understand what's going on. He shares the entire week ahead with them before they even experience it. God sometimes does that for you. He gives you a warning sign and says, hey, 2022 is going to be a rough year, or 2030 might not be a great year, or this relationship is ending. You need to prepare for that. But oftentimes, just like the disciples, we're more worried about going to Jerusalem than we are about all the other details. The Son of Man? I don't know who that is, but it sounds like a rough ride. You better just hang with us, Jesus, and we'll get through it just fine. I wonder what we're doing after Jerusalem. Lent is the perfect time to refocus. To refocus ourselves and saying, this is what it's about. God is declaring what it's about, and if we listen, if we listen, there wouldn't just be fear and astonishment, but there'd be power as we walk through this together. From Palm Sunday to Ash went from Ash Wednesday to Palm Sunday, and then from Palm Sunday to Monday Thursday to a Friday service to Easter morning, God has laid out this story for us over and over again so we can experience it. And let's discuss some of the things that He wants us to refocus on. Lent wants to refocus our attention. Our attention. We get so distracted. I love watching commercials now that my life is a little bit settled, where we have pretty much what we need in our household. We're not rich by any means, but we've limited ourselves and say, okay, we're satisfied with what we have. Commercials are those 15 or 30 second things that say, you're not getting enough out of life unless you have this thing. It seems kind of ridiculous, the people that they show. I look at their kitchen and my kitchen and say, wow, they really keep that thing clean. Look at how handsome they are. Their kids are amazing. And then I look at real families and say, oh, they're not doing so well. They should buy that thing. Day by day, people are vying for your attention. Through the media, through press, through social media, uh, your friends, your family, everyone's trying to get your attention. And Jesus is calling out for your attention as well. Jesus says in John chapter 3, the son of, just as Moses was lifted up like a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes on him may he happen to have eternal life in him. Now, if you don't know this passage, this is a passage where the people of Israel were sick. And God specifically tells Moses to raise up a snake in, on a pole, this outline of a snake. And, and if you see that, if you see God's presence in that, and you look at that, that's when healing would come. Perhaps you know a doctor that has that Greek symbol. That idea that they have a little symbol of, a, of maybe a cross or a line with wings and a snake on there. The symbol of medicine and healing. That's a cultural thing that they would have known. And Jesus shares that of saying, you know how that's kind of in your culture where you have that idea of, of everybody's got to lift up and look at the fireworks in the sky? The same thing's got to happen to me. I have to be lifted up or else it would go unnoticed. Jesus knew the cost of the cross, but he also knew their reason. And the reason was to get your attention. So as we close this week together, this last week together, what ways does Jesus use to get people's attention through his ministry and in the journey up to Easter? Can you remember any? How he could have done it quietly, and oftentimes he did. But other ways, Jesus draws their attention and said, you need to pay attention to this. I'll show you what power I have. I'll show you what authority I have. I'll show you who I am. Pay attention. What ways do we fool ourselves in thinking, oh yeah, I'm paying attention to God. But we're not, really. We're not paying attention to what he does. As we head towards Easter, it's an important time to think about whether we're really focusing on this holiday or not, and on the meaning behind it. Take time to write that down. Pause the video and think about it. 
or talk about with the group around you. We'll move on to our next focus for Easter. Well, Lent also helps us with our confusion. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I see a great release in people when they come to know the Lord is the confusion in your life dissipates. As you begin this relationship with God, you know who you are. You know where you stand because you know who He is and where He stands. And this process of Lent leading up to Easter helps dissipate that confusion. And John chapter 12 shares this in a retrospective way. As John wrote his story after the resurrection, he was able to look back and see what was happening. And you have this section, this uh, scripture in your study guide and also on the screen. It says this, At first, his di disciples did not understand this. Only later, after Jesus was glorified, that means after he was resurrected, after he was ascended, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. This is Palm Sunday, by the way. That's when this scripture happens. John comes back and says, you know, people, they didn't understand what was going on until way later. But what they had seen, they testified about. You may not understand what God's doing with your life from beginning to end, but what you have seen, you can testify about. They didn't get all this stuff. They didn't get the top stuff about all the things that have to happen to the Messiah. But they did get this. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, was able to walk through Jerusalem and say, this guy raised a guy from the dead. Well, who is he? I don't know. What's he stand for? I don't know. Why is he up on that cross? I don't know. Confusion and clarity from confusion and refocusing from our confusion doesn't mean we have all the answers. But we do know what we know. Not only afterwards, when Jesus gets glorified, when Jesus gets credit for the kid that you've invested in that grew up to be a good kid because you invested in them in Jesus. Or the neighbor who you serve and has a good life because you've served them. Only when Jesus is glorified on the other end of that, at the result, do you sometimes realize what's been done. But you can testify to that which you know. So as you look at the story of Easter or Jesus' ministry in general, how did Jesus face that issue of having to clarify all the confusion? People thought he was here for this, but he had to clarify that, no, I'm doing this instead. How did Jesus work that way in people's lives? What in our lives makes us confused? Although we think we're beyond that. We have our phones to schedule ourselves. We have uh, schedules for everything. But there's still a lot of confusion. How does that show up in our life in real and practical ways? Where do we need Lent? We need Easter to wash away that stuff. And move our confusion into focus. Take time to write about that and pause this video and think about it or talk about it with those whom you're watching it with before we go to our next section. One of the things that Lent helps us do as well is understand living out these habits of clarity. This refocusing of saying, listen, there's not much you have to know to follow God. To know this freedom and this new life through Jesus Christ. And the Easter story is it. You get what you need there to have the basics to live with clarity. But you have to live it out. That's why Paul reminds the Corinthians that as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You've seen that every time you've done communion, probably in a local church, that the pastor will say that. Hey, just a reminder, when we're eating this bread and we're drinking this cup, we're trying to remind you that there's one story. One story. It's Jesus, his body, and his blood shed for you. That's easy, isn't it? It's one of the purposes of Lent, is to help us to live it out. Not just to think about it, 
but to have a physical way to remind ourselves that it's what communion is. I'm saying it's not just theory. This was a person who did this for us. This was God in person who came down to serve us and give his life for us. That's why some of the habits that come out in Lent are that. Putting actual ashes on yourself to remind yourself of your humanity. Fasting or abstaining. Praying or doing the habits of reconciliation. Not just talking about being spiritual, but living it out. Coming and celebrating the Last Supper. Who celebrates a dinner where someone gets betrayed? We do. Because we know the results of that betrayal. Celebrating Good Friday together. Who mourns for someone? For a criminal who was put to death in a criminal way? We do. Because we understand false precedences. And we know that the righteous sometimes get caught in things. Because the righteous one was on the cross for our sake. Who comes together and celebrate an empty tomb? We do. We live out our faith. We don't just talk about it. In what ways did Jesus have to challenge people to live out their faith? How in very unique ways did he have to push people to say, hey, it's not enough to just think things. You have to live it. You have to work on it. You have to breathe it. How did he show that during Easter? How did he show that during his ministry? What things did Jesus do that are marked in your brain of saying, oh, oh, he showed me how to do that. Instead of just talking about it, he lived it out. What about you and I? Or where do we sometimes get caught in the theoretical? We think big ideas, but we don't actually put it in practice. In what ways do we miss the opportunities to see God at work in our lives? Because we're only in theory, and we're not living it out. Reading about how to play soccer is completely different than going out in the field and playing it. Watching a video about how to sew a shirt is completely different than cutting the material and trying to sew it together. A seeing a TV show about how to build a house is different than laying the brick yourself. In what ways does Jesus show us the way to live, and do we need to remind it to refocus and live out our faith. Spend some time to think about that, and write it down, or talk about it with those who are around you, until we join again for the conclusion and our prayer together for this week. Well, I pray that this series on Lent was encouraging to you, but more than that, I pray it's effective for you. That you can think through the next time you celebrate Lent, the idea of, is God calling me to fast or to abstain from something? Is this 40 days where I'm going to pray a little bit harder? Or I'm going to learn how to reconcile a little bit more? Do some penance for things that I've fallen short on? Not because they're religious, but because I know God did things for me. I want to live it out. I pray that as you head towards Easter, that you've been able to walk through that process of repenting. That you've been able to reorient your life a little bit. And you've been able to reconnect either to God or to other people. And as you journey for the week ahead towards Easter, that you would be able to refocus. There is only one gospel. It is Jesus Christ crucified and risen for you and I. I pray that that wouldn't be in theory in your life but it would apply to the deepest part of your heart. That it wouldn't be that they're a sinner or they're a sinner and they need help, but that for you and I be, I'm the one drowning. I'm the one that needs the grace of God. I'm the one that needs Jesus. So let's close in prayer to that end as we look forward to Easter and complete the process of Lent together. Father, help us to refocus that there is one story, and you tell us over and over again, the Son of Man will go to Jerusalem. The religious people will get riled up. The, the secular people will beat him and crucify him. He'll die and rise again. Help us to remember you. That bread and juice really mean body and blood. Help us to live out our faith through Lent so that we would testify with what we know that Jesus is, that he was, and he is coming again. 
that there's a purpose to the cross, that there's a reminder in the Last Supper, and that Easter morning can bring us joy that lasts eternally. We thank you for our time together, for who you are, and for what you're doing in our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you again for joining us in this four-week series. Again, if you missed any of this information or missed a week of study, go to our church website. Go to Bethlehem.org slash Lent. And you'll find all the videos and the study guides. May you walk through Lent with the ability to repent, the ability to reorient your life, to reconnect with God and then with others, and to refocus on the story that matters the most. It's Jesus Christ crucified and risen. Amen and amen.